at some point during the episode, Johnny mentions the passcode. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to tell you where, you have to listen to the whole thing. Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that gives you a peek inside the minds of some truly inspirational teachers. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Johnny Hall. Hi, Johnny. How are you? That's about. Thank you, Kieran. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you back, Johnny, and great to sit down one-on-one, give you a proper Paxman treatment grilling. I know when you said, oh, life is the right introduction. That I'm already nervous. Obviously, I mean, you probably need no introduction, but we always begin with our guests and numbers. Right. Um, just to get a feel for who they are, where they're from. So my first question to you is years as a teacher. Well, I had to check because I've got my uh, PDC certificate scanned away. And apparently I did my PDC in 2005. So I reckon 18 years, if you don't count your PDC, 19 if you count it, which is a up for debate, I guess, whether your training year even counts as a year of teaching. Some people count it, some people don't. Really? I mean, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine any teaching I did when I was training actually counted as teaching. <laughs> Yeah, in that case, 18 qualified years, let's say. Yeah. First year group taught? Um, I remember my very first lesson was year sevens, and I was teaching order of operations or um, the dreaded bid mass lesson. And it went pretty terribly, I seem to remember it. Was, uh, I think the, the, the little year sevens ate me alive, but um, I'd like to think I've got a bit better since then. I mean, that's hands down the best answer to that question from a secondary teacher because it always perplexes secondary teachers. And sometimes you will get uh, like the range of classes. Sometimes you won't get an answer at all. You know, I I just assumed, I just assumed every teacher would remember exactly what their first ever lesson was. I was because I mean, I was was absolutely scared, um, scared silly in the night before. I guess, but you put so much preparation into it and then your legs just go to jelly that first lesson. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, But it's also amazing how quickly those nerves go. I think like after you've taught them a few times, it's like, oh. Been doing it forever, kind of. Last year group taught? Year eight, period five today. Nice. How'd that go? Were you sharing um, I was, too? What was I doing? I was drawing graphs, um, direct proportion graphs, so uh, exchange rates and things like that. So not the most exciting lesson for a period five on a Tuesday, but you know, they seem to get a lot out of it. I mean, especially as it's a Monday. Is it Monday? Oh, my God. Jeez, yeah. I told you I've been ill. I'm not thinking straight. Is it? Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> It is Monday. <laughs> I've planned all my lessons for tomorrow as well. So, yeah, I have planned for Tuesday, though, thankfully. You'll be glad to know. Most but important year group? Most important year group. Like, I, my heart wants to say they're all equally important and stuff like that. But realistically, if you're a secondary teacher, year 11 is the most important year group. Probably followed by year seven, giving them the best start possible and kind of like, you know, setting the expectations and the routines for the rest of the year group. If you nail year seven, then hopefully they'll carry on that through the year groups. But let's not pretend year 11 aren't the most important. Favourite year group? Favourite year group. They are all equally my favourite. They're all equally challenging and exciting in, in different measures. Um, yeah, the year sevens with their kind of turn over my page and things like that. To the to the to the to all the way up to the year 11s and yeah i can't really pick a favorite because that's just not fair of them especially if any of them listen to this and say so you didn't pick me i don't want to go through that so it's just not worth it good yeah. point do you teach all like across the full spread yeah i've got one of each this year so seven eight nine ten eleven obviously um, i'm only monday to wednesday in my school which does mean all my classes are split classes but i do at least have one of each year group which is which is nice i didn't have that last year i didn't teach any year nines last year I mean, it's a busy start to the week. You get all those year groups and... <laughs> yeah, what was, uh, to be fair, Monday was, this Monday was my, my because we have a split timetable, so I only had three lessons this Monday. Um, but come tomorrow, yeah, ask me. If I, yeah, that's why I didn't agree to do it at the end of Tuesday, because I've got a five-period day tomorrow. So, yeah, I'll be like, I'll be asleep by now. Number of websites? Number of websites. I mean, I've only really got two. Like, there's the, the really old ones, like... Flash maths and Flash doesn't even work anymore, like Adobe Flash. It, it's still there, though. I just keep renewing it just because it's, it's there. But really, I've got Math Spot and I've got Form Time Ideas. Those are the big two. Um, I did toy around with Noit with um, when uh, my first, my little lad who's five now, when uh, I did shared parental leave um, five years ago. 
and I made a little site called nonexamples.com. And I know Neil was a fan of that. And it's still there, but I've just, there's only so much time you have. Um, so I'm not going to bother renewing that. So if anyone wants the domain name nonexamples.com, it's a, it's coming up. Um, it'll come come up for a steal at like £10 a, a year in, in a few months. So, so claim it. Um, but what I will do, rather than waste all that code, I'll probably put the effort um, to, to port it all over to MassBot and just have it all in, in one big site. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, you told me how massive your server was, so you might as well have, uh, have that available. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, I pay enough right now, and they've jacked up the price like threefold last last year. So, uh, yeah, hence the uh, the plea for patrons, really. <laughs> I mean, you deserve as many patrons as <coughs> possible. Number of form time ideas. Oh, there's thousands and thousands, but apparently not enough because I still get emails saying, when are you going to add some more jokes? And my reply is always, well, if you send me a list of jokes, so long as they're clean and they're funny, then I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll upload them to the site. So if you've got some great facts or some jokes or whatever the other activities are, then yeah, send them my way and I'll get them uploaded. But again, that's kind of just like been sat there. It's kind of cool. It's like, it's one of those sites that I spent two weeks on uh, an Easter 10 years ago now, literally, it was a, it's a decade old now. Spent the whole Easter holiday making it because I thought it was cool. Enjoyed making it. And then hopefully uh, over the last 10 years, it saved people quite a lot of time because it's just one of those one-click resources. And I mean, the, the kids just gravitate towards the flags every single time and they love it. Uh, but there's a load of other nice stuff on there as well. So if you've not seen it, yeah, check out Born Time Ideas. Number of math spot features? 188. <laughs> yep. I just counted now just before I came on. Um, I did say, uh, I joked with Joe Morgan, actually, I think it was about three years ago that I'm going to stop at 100 because I think, like, I got on those maths gems. Then eventually Joe just doesn't put me on the maths gems anymore. She says, oh, everyone knows about you, so there's no point putting you on, which, uh, I mean, I'd still like to be on a maths gem if you are listening, uh, Joe. Uh, yeah, but I did make a joke, I'm going to stop at 100 and then, like, go back and make every other resource a little bit better. Um that's obviously gone out the window because I'm up to 188. But um, I have recently um, actually got rid of a couple of, of real junk ones. Like you, when you like, go back and look over your lesson plans from like 10 years ago and you think, oh, God, what was I thinking? It's the same thing when you look at a resource that you made 10 years ago and think, I, I don't want people using this in the classroom. So a few resources that I've slightly just deleted and no one's got back to me yet saying, Johnny, where's that resource gone? Um, so fingers crossed no one was using it. Um, some of the ones which are used loads, like, um, yeah, the, which I wasn't keen on. Like, there was the question generator, one of the question generators. It was terrible. Uh, there was, I did spend a Thursday afternoon making it all miles better. And I, I did actually release that on Twitter saying, like, you can put, like, URL parameters and stuff like that and save it and things like that. So 188, and I'm not going to, I'm trying to keep it roughly down to that. Number of rooms required as a minimum for one of your sessions, Johnny. One. I'm not. I'm not big headed. I know. I know you joked when you was in Dubai and I had two rooms or something daft like that. But yeah, one will do me fine. I'm grateful for anyone that turns up to my to my session. And yeah, it's the uh, it's the delegates that make a good session. It's not the uh, it's not what I talk about. I just hand about nice bits of plastic and coloured plastic and people play with them. That's that's all. And number of tweets. How many? What's that? Number of tweets. Number of tweets. Oh, I don't know. I missed that question. Shall I have a look? It tells you on Twitter, doesn't it, if you load on? It does. Um, so number of tweets, apparently. 19,900. And it rounds that, doesn't it? Or it might truncate it. I don't know. I'm guessing it truncates it, so it wouldn't round up. So I thrive. Well, I don't know. My next tweet could be my 20,000. 20, oh, yeah. You're going to need to make it a special math spot tweet. How do you actually know? Does it? If you hover over, does it tell you? This episode's going to center around math spots, mm -hmm. but you're a teacher, developer, mathematical task designer, amongst many other things. Tell us about your journey and how you got here. So my journey, well, obviously I mentioned I, I trained 18 years ago now up in um, Leeds Trinity, and then I did a couple of years maternity cover. And back in the day, like um, there wasn't a a vast shortage of maths teachers like they are nowadays. So this maternity teacher cover came back and uh, I didn't have a job anymore. It wasn't like the scenario nowadays where like, you just do anything to keep a maths teacher at your school. So I had to find uh, another place. I did love that school and they were sad to leave me, but obviously you can't just take someone's job. So then I moved to um, what's now known Leeds City Academy 
and I've now been there ever since. It was City Leeds School, now Leeds City Academy, and it's been through some changes over the years. And um, and now, well, it's just like well, you don't stay at a place for sixteen years unless it's kind of a, a special place to you. Uh, the kids are absolutely lovely. It has its challenges, just like every school does. But um, yeah, I'm not going to spend sixteen years there if I don't if I don't love it. Um, and that's my teaching side of things. Um, yeah, I've, I've been head of department for about five years at some point. Uh, I've been lead practitioner for the last maybe six, seven years or something like that. And yeah, and now re- recently, I would say recently, in the last four years, uh, I've, I've basically dropped down to three days teaching, Monday to Wednesday, and two days I've been working for Complete Maths for the uh, last four years. And, and more recently, I've I've gone it alone, shall we say, with with trying to develop MathSpot and make it as good as can possibly can be. So that's my current situation, lead practitioner, three days a week and uh, two days math spotting. 16 years is a long time. And you're thinking that this, you've got this great environment. Why would you invite Dave Taylor to work there? <laughs> Why would you invite Dave? <laughs> for the listeners that don't know him, um, I, I also work with Dave. I mean, I've known Dave for, for probably more than a decade because he's been, he's been, he was at um, another school. I'll not mention, give any personal details with Dave out. He was another school and then a job came up at ours and I was like, Dave, please come work for us. Um, Because I'm sure Catherine Darwin won't mind uh, mentioning that I had the pleasure of working with Catherine last year, uh, who was then gone on to bigger and greater things with Dr. Frost. And then uh, Catherine's lead practitioner all opened up and I was like, straight on the phone for Dave, Dave, please, um, please come and join us. And so now me and Dave Taylor are both working there, which is a a nice little team so far. I mean, I've only been working with him for a month, so... um, Hopefully I'm not getting on his nerves too much. You and Catherine would talk about your completion tables. I'm sure you and Dave are talking about uh, back, oh, backward backward examples. He's not actually pestering me that much. I mean, to be fair, we're only four weeks in and he's still getting his feet in the new environment. I reckon um, it's not going to be long before he starts pestering me with backwards. He's done it once, to be fair. He said, Johnny, what do you reckon about taking a GCSE paper and like producing backwards faded versions of the, of the whole thing i'm like great dave get cracking like i'm not sure how long it's going to take him but um he's a machine i mean you work with dave you know how fast he works he'll probably get it done in half an hour but, um, yeah watch this space backward faded exam papers maybe coming out of, out of dave taylor sometime soon <laughs> we've spoken about manipulatives on the podcast um mm-hmm. different sort of maths aspects but MathSpot is something that we always recommend teachers utilize. But when I see other teachers sharing their photographs on social media or sharing them with friends and things, I'm thinking, I don't use that bit enough. Or, oh, I didn't know that was a thing. And so I thought, yeah. you spent a lot of time over the summer really trying to develop MathSpot. And I thought it'd be fantastic to sort of share what what it, what the full capacity is. You know, because I'm sure the bits that I tell people about are only a, a fraction. Mm-hmm. But I think it makes sense to start at the beginning. Where did the idea for MathSpot come from? And which came first, learning to code or the idea? All right. Well, the, the learning to code one's easy because um, I, I the learning to code came much earlier. Because if you, I don't know if you remember those BBC micro computers back in the day. Um, my dad bought me one of those when I was about six or seven and he bought me like a little book where you'd copy out the program line by line and then you'd hit run and then you'd you'd play like whatever Space Invaders or whatever you'd you'd coded in and then uh, yeah you'd you'd study the code and then the next section of the book was okay do you want to try and learn to write your own kind of programs and it got me hooked on there so um, once you know how to program that was obviously like BBC Basic but once you know how to program it's it's transferable the the key words and the syntax might be slightly different, but essentially it's all about loops and things like that. It's 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 pretty pretty easy. And like as a maths teacher, like you're essentially just choosing two random numbers and adding them together. And the computer does all the hard work of actually actually doing the maths. You just tell tell it the process to do so. Um, yeah, the, the coding came first. As to why it came around though. Basically, we got told that every lesson, you know, needs those like one star, two star, three star difficulties. I got told that, okay, um, every 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 lesson in the department needs this same structure for every lesson. I'm like, so you've got to write those by hand for five, potentially five lessons for every day. And it's it's not even that great. It's not even that great practice anyway. I mean, it's, it's useful. It's got, it's got its, 
you know, sometimes it's useful, but most of the time it's probably not. You can probably do something better with the time. So I thought, right, I'm just going to like see if I can automate it. So I just did like a little mock up um, and I showed it this guy just to get him off my back. And he was like blown away with it saying, oh, this is the biggest, the best thing I've ever, I've ever seen. And that's, that's how my spot started weirdly. <laughs> Uh, just me trying to solve a work kind of problem, I guess, in in that uh, context. Um, and then, yeah, then I quickly realized that's probably not not the the best thing on the site, not the best resource on the site. And um, I started making better things. But essentially, from that very first little problem of how can I make my job a little bit easier. When I'm talking to teachers about maths, but I'm saying, you know, th- this will make your life easier. This will make your job easier because... Mm-hmm. Things that, like you say, you have to do manually or that you might have to generate yourself can mm-hmm. be generated. I mean, I've worked through, you know, the, the section where you generate the almost like test style questions. You know, you almost get, you get your crossover, you get your foundation, you're higher. Oh, yeah, yeah. So whenever I don't have an indefinite or an infinite bank of questions, but whenever I'm working with, say, 15, 16 year olds, Mm-hmm. That'll be my first port of call. I took quite a lot of our teaching assistants through the GCSEs, um, through mm-hmm. the Foundation GCSE in 2017, 18. That, and yeah. I would use that as my sort of bank whenever it came to revision time. So we went through a sequence over the first year. And then the second year, I would stick on a, stick on maths button, have an idea of this is what I want to the model. Because it was the, the test taking technique that... That they were worried about and stuff. Well, um, that's, you know, that's kind of what I wanted it to, to be used for. Like most of those questions are um, are basically questions that I coded because um, one of my classes at some point will have struggled on a particular mock question like that. So I said, okay, right, if we're struggling on this, let's 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 randomly generate it so you can have a, a lot of practice at it. And then I'd kind of like give them weekly iterative uh, tests. So like they'd do a mock paper, and then for about three or four weeks, I'd, I'd teach them the stuff that the they messed up on on the test and like every week give them a, a, a weekly test with that question in and then after the end of the second week they've got two questions and then three questions and so on and uh, it really helps well I, I, you can't say for certain whether it really helps or not but like one year group where I did that for was like one of the one of the best results I well not my results one of the best results the kids kids got so um yeah I've been a big fan of a uh, weekly testing ever ever since that Ever since, like the words "iterative" and stuff like that became like buzzwords, I just called it "weekly test" about twelve years ago. Maybe not twelve years ago; must thought didn't exist then. Maybe about yeah, maybe seven years ago. When you when you mentioned Flash earlier on, I had, yeah. I, I I sort of try. I would guess that the answer might be that the coding came first. But then, you know, those BBC computers, mm-hmm. all the big tech geniuses cut their teeth on those didn't they you know what i mean so uh, do this do they still make them for kids too i, mean, I want to get my kids some <laughs> i don't know i think into all about like um raspberry pies now or something i don't know you probably speak to your computing expert but i know they do that scratch programming as well and um, i'm not too uh sort of au fait on that but yeah uh, yeah when i started coding it was just a, a black screen and a white flashing cursor saying welcome to basic then you'd type like 10 auto you'd start you'd start you'd start coding like that so very very old school but it was a great fun hours and hours of my childhood wasted doing it well not wasted hopefully i put it to use uh, later down the line it's just always been a hobby and maths has always been a hobby and I, mean, I guess i'm quite lucky to yeah you know i really do like maths and i get to teach maths and then when i go home i do i do hobbies related to maths as well and then I go to maths conference at the weekend and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And is the, yeah, the life of a maths teacher. I, I mean, do I do other stuff as well. By the way, I'm not just maths. I like, I like, I like me, uh, me running. I like woodworking and things like that. Big fan of the garden. How often do you play the guitar behind you, Johnny? Oh yeah, I got a guitar as well. Yeah, yeah I mean that's all. Maths, not playing right? it now though. Yeah, I'm not playing it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see that for Atoll's episode. No, mainly because I'll get absolutely killed because the <laughs> one-year-old's just gone. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, most of the computing teaching, to my knowledge, in primary is block based. So, like you said about loops and things I got there, I think the bit yeah. that certainly whenever I taught computing, I never really got across the language aspect and the mm. idea that you know computing and the language you're you know it's looking for those patterns and and things just like you would when you're learning English. I thought, yeah, sometimes I'll show kids how like you can just literally fire up Notepad 
they're like what every any computer has and like that's all you need to make a, a website like and i'll just quickly fire up i i, I do i did like an after school coding club once so i just fired up notepad and just like in about two minutes showed them how to create like a randomly generated mass worksheet just by using a for loop and tell them how many questions you want and then just choose your x and y add them together and it's like they're amazed at almost how like simple it can actually be and i've not just kids I've shown as well. I've shown like a, um, a few interested maths teachers. Like they, they say, how oh, how do you do it? And, uh, and I'll just send them like a template file and say, have a play with this. Because you open it up, you right click, open it in like the source mode. And just, it's just, it, sh it should be self-explanatory for any maths teacher just to be able to read it and see what the variables are, change them, see how they're going to change. It's, um, it's dead straightforward. Um, and it's really, it's really good fun as well. So, and... Um, one thing I've really found is like, do you know, like when you when you're trying to get a real deep understanding of a of a topic or a question, um, actually coding a question which which generates that, like the ability to do that is is great CPD. Like, um, I was coding a question on like rationalizing the denominator last night, as you do on a Sunday, and like it's dead easy just to to, to rationalize it just by um sort of like multiplying the numerator and the denominator. But then the hard bit is like, how are you going to ensure that like it all simplifies nicely or if it doesn't simplify? And before you know it, you, you're getting into all sorts of like nuts and bolts of, of, of the number. And it essentially it all boils down to prime factorization and the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. You've got to be checking against all these primes and stuff. And it just shows all these links between math that like you might not have necessarily realized if you hadn't coded a question. It's like when you, you get kids maybe to make up a question of their own, make up a hard question, make up an easy question, make up a question that looks hard, but is actually easy and getting them to think about that, that those sort of prompts. I think it's a similar thing that goes on when I'm coding um, math spot questions. You you really have to get under the under the bonnet of the math that's going on. So, yeah, I can recommend it a decent CPD as well, to be honest, as well as being great fun. Maybe, th maybe we could do a, a conference session on that one day. Yeah, no, I, th I think I'll be interested. Yeah, what I've learned from coding math spot that could be an interesting title because you, you really have to think about mm. all the parameters, all like you say, all the variables. Absolutely, yeah. Because it, it's not going to generalize if something's out of place, is it? Every question that I code for math spot, I don't know. Um, it goes from a naught to ten difficulty scale. Um, I've changed the word to difficulty on purpose because I used to call it a level zero to ten, and people like, well, what what key stage level is this at all? What GCSE grade is this? And like, it's not. I mean, it's just a difficulty. What I think is the easiest possible instant, uh, the easiest possible um, instance of this concept, up to what I think is the the hardest you'd realistically ever want to do. So, like the rationalizing denominator one I was mentioning, like is is a dead simple sort of integer over a third with no common factors all the way up to where you've got loads of common factors to simplify at the end. Uh, I passed this function into what I call the differentiator, which has got all these 10 levels and like the variables change. And it's coding the actual question normally takes me five minutes. Coding the differentiator for it to get all these levels right is a trial and error game. It can often take me like a couple of hours to, to, till I'm really happy with it. And there's loads on maths, but I'll look back at now. And now I've got a bit of time and I'm thinking I've learned a lot in the last 10 years and um, I need to go back and, and fix that. And, and most of the time it's because I've tried to cram too much into one concept. Uh, and what I need to do is go back and actually split it into two separate questions. Like there's, there's, there's one called fractions of amounts, but really it needs splitting out into sort of like maybe unit fractions of amounts and non-unit fractions of amounts. And um going a little bit more sort of granular in the question um not to all of them like rounding is another classic example if you click on rounding it's got all of rounding from like nearest integer to nearest 10 to decimal places all the way to sig figures and i made that like probably nine years ago maybe 10 years ago now but that needs sorting like you're not going to teach all them in a lesson so why would you have them all in in one Concept they need splitting out into round into integers, round into powers of 10, round into decimals, round into significant figures. There's potentially four more questions. Then each of those will have a slider from zero to 10. Like those tricky decimal place ones where like the nine carries forward and clocks everything round and things like that. Um, uh, yeah, there's a just thinking how much work I've got to do on it. There's 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 not enough time in the day. Uh, it's a it's a lifelong job this is gonna be.
I mean, that, that's definitely, you've got enough for a couple of mass, mass comp talks there, Johnny. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that's the, the nuts and bolts of thinking about the questions you set for pupils and things. Like you say, you know, how often yeah. do we try and put too much content into one yeah. say, sequence, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think and I'm all, yeah. And I'm also, yeah, I'm, I'm also conscious that like, there is a massive sort of mass teacher, well, teacher storage in general, like, and there's lots of, there's new, new mass teachers as well. So I want mass bot to be sort of like almost a tool that, like kind of holds the hand a little bit they want to be able to go on and say okay, i'm introducing this topic if i i know that if i start on level zero that will probably be a decent example problem pair uh to, to maybe show the class um it's still never going to be as good as the teacher sitting down and thinking of what examples they want to use but i'm not naive enough to realize that i sort of like you know that's not always the case sometimes people have five period days they just fire up my spot and they just take whatever it gives them. And and I want to make sure that whatever it gives them is is as, as good as possible. Uh, so you do feel a, feel a bit of sense of sort of like um, responsibility when you've got so many people using it. Like you want it to be you want it to be good because essentially like there's kids at the end of this which are using your stuff. And if, it, if you're serving them up rubbish and um, it's, it's your fault, basically. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I haven't seen any rubbish on there yet. Um, on, oh, fuck you. <laughs> no, no, maybe, uh, I mean, you're always critical of your own stuff. So I, I know there's there's lots and lots to be done. There's lots of good stuff, don't get me wrong. But um, I've got like this to-do list that I've got, if I showed it you. It's uh, hundreds of items long. Yeah, And that's before I even had Neil Armand's suggestions. <laughs> yeah, his private connection via Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. What do you think are the three most important features on MathSpot and how can teachers get the most from them? I can tell you the one I use every day without fail for every lesson almost. And that's my, my camera tool, my visualizer tool, recently sponsored by Hue Cameras. So buy a Hue visualizer if you're, if you're, if you're hearing this. Um, and it's just literally, it's on the homepage of MathSpot, the little camera in the corner. You click on that and it just fires up your visualizer. And it's just really useful um, rather than loading up a, a separate piece of software like the camera tool on Windows because you can have it in your tabs. So you can just flick them out. You can actually have several cameras open if you really want to um, all, all at the same time. Uh, so I use that without fail at every lesson because there's, there's very rarely um, a lesson where at some point a kid won't say something and say, oh, let, let's just go over that under the visualizer or... I'll be doing an example problem pair or something. And more often than not, I much prefer to do it under a visualizer than like a digital version. I know I've been saying how like I want my spot to be as good as possible, but like I don't think, well, I know that what's on my spot, which is generated by a computer, is never going to be as good as what a human can go through under a visualizer. That's a big statement. And I know with AI going mental at the moment and stuff like that, but I don't believe there's only going to be a situation where where not doing it under the visualizer and responding to the needs of the class there and then is not going to be better than a, a computer generated one because you don't know if little Jimmy over there is paying attention and stuff like that. If the computer can't tell that, but as you're doing an example under the visualizer, you can you can spot out and keep an eye on these things. So yeah, the visualizer tool is 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 a big one for me. There there are some companies, mm -hmm. um, I mean, really big names in the sort of AI slash maths world who believe that AI will be as responsive as teachers. Do you, do you think they're off? They're missing the mark. Uh, I don't, I can't see it happening before I'm retired. I'm not saying it won't happen, but like, I guess it's a bit like, you know, like the, um, maybe the chess computer debate from like a few years ago, like if, in the 1990s, it was just no contest. Humans, humans would beat computers and then at some point in the 90s, I can't remember what it was, it was like 92 or something, when that deep blue faced Gary Kasparov or something. And then the computers won the first game. And like ever since that moment, like literally humans don't have a chance against a computer now. Maybe there will be that tipping point. Um, well, I can't see it happening for a good 20 years or so or something like that. And I'm hoping to have retired within 20 years, to be honest. Um, I can't still, I can't still. <laughs> Can't still see me teaching into my well into my sixties. So um, no, I'm never say never, but now I don't think we're anywhere close to um, a computer being better than a than an expert 
practitioner under a visualizer, bigging myself up there a little bit. But like, I've been doing this for 18 years. Like, maybe a computer might be better than someone that's maybe brand new to teaching, but um, not at the moment, I don't think. No, I'm with you. I just thought I'd throw it your way with your expertise because there's almost like this, I don't know, transient information that you pass on to the pupils when you're working with manipulatives. You know, I always talk about movement and how important it is, for instance, in the structures of arithmetic, you know, because the distinction between augmentation and aggregation is one of context and movement, you know? And so mm -hmm. I, I think we look at the body language and the behavior of the other person. Yeah. I don't know if an avatar could replace that. I'm sure someone's studying that as we speak. But there's something in this, you know, this bringing everything together that expresses something that you can only sort of hope to achieve. Probably going to be relatively easy to program computers to like pick up maybe common misconceptions that pupils might say. So I don't know if they're multiplying by 10, 1.2 multiplied by 10 and they stick on a zero or something. It'd be dead easy to, to code that misconception. If a kid types in 1.20, then the computer could easily pick up that misconception. But it's... It's more about the, the things that go on in a lesson that kids notice and like all, all the time kids will maybe maybe just make it make a, a statement that they've noticed something or they've, they've come up with something themselves and like I don't see how you're going to get a computer to respond in the moment to that because quite often a kid might say something really interesting and then your lesson goes down a rabbit hole for 10 minutes. I guess I suppose like you could make the argument, should you go down the rabbit hole? Are you are you wasting time? I guess it's an opportunity cost kind of thing there. Uh, but in terms of like the, the kids' experience of a maths lesson and the enjoyment of it, I do think those are quite valuable moments. Um, I know Sam Bladewick um, has a lot of these moments. I've, I've seen him do a few presentations now and he always blows my mind with his enthusiasm. If you told him that he's never allowed to go off on one in a lesson on a tangent, I'm sure he'd be uh, devastated. But that does raise the moral question of like, just because you enjoy it, um, is it strictly better than sticking to the straight and narrow road of this is the curriculum, this is what I must teach next, rather than showing the the little wonderful nuggets of maths that, that appear just because the kid's asking a really nice question. The sheer number of responses that pupils might give, and then those, those responses might change depending on where you are in the country or in the world, even if they're all speaking English. You know, it's the expert teacher who recognises the mistake in what's been said, isn't it? You know, so that, you know, I think you'd have a, a tough time. Although if the program was making itself smarter based on the input yeah. it was getting, who knows? But yeah, no, I, I'm with you. I think mass teachers aren't, you know, yeah. aren't in danger of becoming extinct anytime soon. Yeah. I don't think it's a problem I need to worry about in my career. Maybe if you're a brand new teacher now and you've got four years ahead of you, maybe, maybe there'll be a uh, big changes then, but I, I don't know. Maybe a team mass, but up with a chat GPT and uh, see what happens. <laughs> well, I mean, it can't do maths, can it? It can do so. Actually, you say that, but like you can ask it things like how many zeros at the end of like, say, 200 factorial. And that's quite a well known problem. So it gets that right and it gives you the explanation. But then you can change it to, okay, how many zeros would be at the end of, say, 187 factorial? But it can do the maths for that as well. Uh, um, it's. I was quite impressed. It was uh, Rob that showed me that one. So I was like, "Bloody hell, Rob! That's that's quite impressive because that's taking some quite well. It's university level maths. I remember doing it on my numbers and numbers and proofs module. Uh, so, but then it gets some ridiculously easy things wrong as well. So uh, it swings and roundabouts, I guess. It was. It didn't fur very well. On I was testing it out with the treasure hunt questions for this week's maths con. All right. And it didn't do very well on the ones that Stuart wrote. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Stuart, isn't it, really? Stuart's the problem there. <laughs> you mentioned the camera. The, the tool I use the second most, that's still rubbish English, um, is probably my test maker resource. Um, and it's one of the it, it, growing in popularity, uh, mainly because I've done a redirect from what I considered a rubbish resource and it redirects it to the test maker now. So basically everyone that was trying to get to the old resource gets an automatic redirection uh, to the test maker. So it's building a bit of traffic there. It is miles better because essentially it's the entire bank of MassBot and um, there's a nice little search function on it and you can just pick and choose the topics that you've taught. And um, we start all our lessons with like a sort of like a five minute do now. 
So with my year 11s, so far I've taught them a bit of fractions, a bit of standard form, a bit of loads of indices. Uh, so my, my start for tomorrow's lesson, I'll just literally type those keywords in and just generate a six question or eight question little recall on those topics. And as I teach them more topics, going back to that iterative idea, I'll just keep keep adding the topics. And it's it's so useful just for um, just keeping on top of the basics because we're all guilty of of like teaching a topic as like a discrete unit and then just kind of like moving on and then not visiting that topic as much as you can do and then before you know it, it's just like you've never even taught the topic in the first place to him so this test maker that I've, that I've produced is is my way of just kind of like making sure that we just go back and revisit those those topics again it's not like the most exciting maths in the world but I, I, I do think it's useful and the kids can see themselves sort of like retaining that that knowledge a little bit better and if you want to do an end of sort of end of half term test or something, you have as many questions as you want. And um, the recent addition I've made is, like I said, those URL parameters in, so you can like, you can now save what topics you've chosen. So like, I can literally now make that test for the fractions, the standard forms, the indices, save the URL, and then when I've taught another topic, say similar triangles, just fire it up again, add that topic to it, save the URL again, and like. It's no, it's no, or literally you just have to add an extra topic and save it and just paste it into your PowerPoint, paste it into your spreadsheet or whatever you want. So the plan is now this feature, and it's not just on the test maker, it's rolled across all of the question generators because this, this one bank of question feeds like several resources and they all can be now sort of like, like I say, you can all put, you can put the parameters in the URL and just save it wherever you want on your scheme. So the idea is hopefully at some point, whether MathBot might even become a, its own scheme or curriculum itself, or people will start linking to MathBot from their own schemes, either in an Excel spreadsheet or if they use some fancy technology or whatever um, that way as well. So that's the the ultimate aim, which hopefully people will start doing now once they realise they can do it. I'm not sure it's very well known yet. I did a little um, promo video on it, but... I mean, it only got like a couple of hundred views. So if people don't figure it out themselves, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how many people are going to watch this. So maybe uh, maybe they'll they'll watch it and think, yeah, I'll try that out. How recognisable would primary teachers find some of the questions? Because obviously I, I think there's quite a lot in the foundation paper that they would actually think, oh, that's stuff we teach as well. Yeah, well, this goes back to when I said I'll look back at the stuff and I'm like a little bit embarrassed maybe like us. The whole of addition is one question on mass part. Now, if you tell that to a primary teacher, like addition is just like, like one lesson, um, they're probably going to look at you mad. So one of my things on my to-do list is to split up addition into, into, into its proper parts. Like you showed me that teaching children to count, count, calculate mentally, was it? Is that the name of it? Of that? Yes, yes, yeah. So I've still got it saved on my phone. And uh, that like basically it, it breaks addition down into it until it's all it's different. But well, it's not just addition, it's got all the operations in. So the plan is to have a whole section on MassBot called mental calculations. And then the whole of the whole of that massive booklet, um, like near doubles and things like that. And I mean, I don't I'm not I'm not au fait with all the primary terminology, but um yeah, there's there's a lot of work to do there. So that's that's the that's a Thursday plan. Um, it'll probably take me a good, I don't know, a good three or four days to probably work through all that load. But it's essentially loads and loads of really easy bits of coding because it's just addition, subtraction, multiplication. There's there's no crazy things going on. I just need to make sure that like, because um, there'll be somewhere like the units digits carries and somewhere the unit digits don't carry into the tens. Like we're talking that sort of level of um, granularity. So that's that's the plan. So basically. I want it to be really useful for primary teachers uh, as well as obviously myself as a secondary because, I mean, secondary teachers will benefit from that as well because there's we always get those kids that are still struggling with the with the basics. I think that will be a game changer, Johnny, because I think confidence with those mental methods is the distinguishing feature between proficient primary age mathematicians mm. and those who struggle. Um, I think it was Tall and Gray said, the kids who don't see that those relationships, they do twice the work for half the payoff because quite often they're yeah. using the former written algorithm and they're getting yeah. it wrong, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I like that formal written algorithm, I reckon, does more harm than good. Like, 
I've got my little five year old and like I'm purposely refusing to show it him because like we we spend our sort of Sunday mornings maybe doing a bit of mass like and I'll ask him things like 37 add 65 or something like that and like he talks me through his little journey what he's going to what he, what he's going to do and like so he says, right, I've got me, me three tens and me six tens. I don't think yeah, that's going to be nine tens, but then I've got a problem with me seven and me five because that's going to make another ten. And he talks me through all these problems and he's getting a little bit faster uh, each time he does it. And my question, and I don't know the answer, you're the expert here, like at what point do you introduce the column, the column method just to speed things up a little bit? Because he's doing everything right. He knows what he's doing. But I fear that if I give him the column method now, that is too early because he, he's not he's not cemented all those little number bond facts and stuff like that. And if I just give him a little get out, do the seven, the five, 12, write the two, carry the one, all of a sudden you're not having those stories about the tens and the units anymore. And I, I don't want to take that away from him. So I guess five's probably a bit too young to <laughs> introduce the formal column, column method, but he, he is like him. He's quite good at maths for his age, I guess. But like, I don't know what would what would you do in that situation? You, you'd be surprised. I I have seen five year olds introduced to it. Thing is, it's quite often introduced in the absence of those rich conversations about how we can manipulate numbers and mm -hmm. what's most efficient. You know, some sometimes the formal algorithms are more efficient. I mean, I've timed myself doing a range of different problems in the past, and sometimes. I could use the formal algorithm quicker than I could mentally manipulate. But with mm. addition, subtraction, with uh, a lot of multiplication, there are, you know, if you use the laws of arithmetic, you use the relationships between different numbers and the proximity of the numbers to your advantage, then that's actually being more proficient, I think. It's officially introduced in key stage one, maybe supposedly sort of halfway through towards the end. I wouldn't go near it until year three at the earliest when kids are what seven yeah. eight years old. Um, but that's you know you, you can expect whenever he's in year two, to have definitely covered it by mm. then, if not earlier. Yeah. So long as he knows what's going on, that's that's the main thing for me. Like because what I was talking about with the this, we had the cues and errors as well, and and we like we we told the story with the cues and errors as well. Well, so he literally had the tens in his hands. He had the the other odds, and he could put the five and the seven together and swap it out for a ten and a two. So he knows what's going on, but I just don't want that to be lost yet with just a an abstract formal method. Um, I see it all the time in year seven. Like kids just have, have come and like they just don't get it, especially when it comes to the subtraction. Like, and it's like maybe two minus seven in the units, and like they just do seven minus two because because that's what they can do they don't think to exchange because they don't know what it actually means they've just been they've just been taught to do subtraction and write that write down the answer and someone's gone really wrong if you get into that stage um and i don't think there's a quick fix from there because they've been shown this column method edition and they they think it's really quick even though they get all their answers wrong it's it's a terrible situation to be in i feel as though there should be almost some sort of like driving test like like that you have to do right you can only use the column method edition if you can prove to me that you know exactly what's going on in all these steps because otherwise it's just like could potentially be more on than on than good it always felt to me like that was the very definition of a misconception because they've clearly overgeneralized to the point where they think that no matter what happens no matter what the situation is I'm yeah. just going to take this one and this one and we'll... yeah, take the smallest from the biggest no matter where the biggest is whether it's on the top or the bottom I don't care just going to do it all of you Kofi, Kofi, Kofufu, however you pronounce it, you damn lovely supporters. It's a song going out to you, to you. Stephanie Taylor, Mrs. B. S. Atea, Adam, Katie, Liv, Dempsey, 
Becca, Jenford, Susie, Brown, and Sio, Nechio, Rachel, I am Al, Jessica, Tom, Oakley, Tom, Brassington, Jessica, Tom, Oakley, Tom, Brassington, LJ, and last but not least, my lovely little Amy Bill, so, they help us pay the bills, so, a massive thank you out to Dabby family, coffee support. Help us keeping it at free There's far more content Coming just round the bend Thank you all for helping Our very special Friends Friends Very special friends I mean we've not talk, not really talked about the virtual manipulative That's That's got to be like one of the biggest It's not the most used But like the, the question generators Are still the most used But uh, the manipulatives have grown massively um, in recent years, because obviously like, they've been quite quite big nationally as, as well. I think uh, loads of organisations have been promoting them. So, yeah, they are used quite extensively now. Um, in particular, like the algebra tiles have been used, which is nice um, in secondary. And um, the the big one in primary is the, the well, I'm guessing it's primary. Place value counters have been used loads now on MassBot, a lot more than the Dean's blocks, which I find interesting. Um, because essentially you, you can only understand place value counters once you understand place value because all the counters are the same size and Dean's blocks gives you that relative size of each one. So I always think place values are just like a little stepping stone between the Dean's blocks and, and the abstract. They're basically just abstract symbols that you can move or, that you can move around. So um, I guess probably because you can fit thousands on the screen a lot easier because they're nice and small and discreet but yeah it's a, I, I found that interesting how much more the place value counters are used than the dean's blocks it's probably by a factor of maybe like five or six uh, which i find i think is interesting it is i think yeah obviously you've got very specific situations where you use the, the sort of the blocks because you're exploring the magnitude of inherent in place value and I think quite often the, the the counters are used, like you said. I mean, I think we've discussed one of the videos I did where I use them whenever I want to represent the mental manipulation I want my pupils to do. But you can often find that they're also being used as like a one-to-one -one correspondence. You know, there are seven in this. They just happen to be in the thousands block. If I'm subtracting four, well, I've got three of those left, and whether or not they understand fully mm. is up for debate. You know, so I think. You might find that a lot of them have been used in secondary schools too, because it's that sort of four-digit addition subtraction that might be yeah. the, the sticking point. Oh yeah, I absolutely, hundred percent see their appeal. Like that, they're, they're much more easy to use than getting massive seven thousand red, red beans blocks. Yeah, it's just um, so long as the the kids have made that that leap to what place value is, which you have to have before you start using place value counters. You need to know that this. This this one that says ten on it is worth ten of these same size ones, which just happen to say a one on it. Rather with the dean's blocks, this ten is literally ten times bigger than the unit. It's, it, there's there's no mistake there. It's just interesting. And cues and air rods are and hardly used at all on the site, which is disappointing because that in terms of fun, those are definitely one of the most um, um, fun, versatile, powerful manipulatives I think there are. So. Uh, Maybe we need a bit more CPD on people using cues and air rods a bit. I suppose they are a bit more specialist, maybe. I don't know. I mean, they're, maybe they're just not as much fun virtually than they are the physical ones where you can build little towers and stuff like that. Whereas the Dean's blocks and the place value counters, they're not fun anyway, even if you've got the physical ones. The Dean's blocks, maybe, um, but they are really useful when you're learning the arithmetic. Maybe, maybe that's the factor. Yeah, I think anyone who's gone to the lengths to develop their CPD with regards to Cuisinart rods will probably also extend towards buying. Yeah. As well as, like you say, there's so much of that early identification of the relationships between the different rods. It's it's a physical act, isn't it? You know, And I think it's later, like you say, quick manipulation, quick modeling as a teacher that yeah. can be useful virtually. But it's, um, yeah, I think, yeah, because you have to get, you have to spend a lot of time to get really proficient with them. I think it, yeah, you might as well then spend the 20 odd quid or whatever it is on a, on a yeah. set for yourself. 
I know we've we spoke at length, haven't we, about like the, the pros and cons of various manipulatives, whether it's physical or virtual. We'll eventually get round to doing a CBD session. I'm, I'm sure I will at some point. Like, but uh, for now, it's it's safe to say that yeah, there's there's pros and cons of each, isn't there? Really, and um, the virtual ones are quick, pixel perfect, uh, and for a secondary teacher, I think potentially often more useful than the uh, than the uh, physical counterparts. I, th I think in particular during times of reasonable austerity, mm -hmm. affordable for schools to engage with as well. Yeah, absolutely. So those are the big three things, but like, um, crucially, the, the main thing that I'm trying to do now with all those three things is link them all together. So I've mentioned the camera tool, I've mentioned the question generators, and I've mentioned the manipulatives. The big thing that I've been scratching my brain of uh, over the last few Thursdays is basically I've trawled through every single question <laughs> on MassBot and I've started to assign it uh, to a manipulative if one's appropriate. So like anything that's to do with arithmetic, I've assigned it like Dean's blocks or cues and air rods. Uh, if it's to do with ratio, then I've assigned it like the bar model tool or cues and air rods again. And like, like it's, it's some some questions can have multiple manipulatives. Anything to do with prime factors, obviously I have my prime factor tiles and stuff like that. Uh, so now any question on the generator, if you load it up using the example problem pair tool, um, you press new questions and you get the usual options like regenerate question, hide question, so you can hide the question on the other side of the screen. Uh, but also um, whatever manipulatives I think are appropriate to model that question with, and I've gone through it like with a fine tooth, tooth comb, so hopefully it's correct. You spot any errors, let me know. Uh, then a little box will appear and you can click on that and it'll it'll fire up that manipulative with the question on the manipulative as well now, like embedded within the manipulative. It won't answer that. It won't show you how to model it. That's still up to the teacher expertise. And it goes back to that conversation, I guess, we had about AI. I don't think we're in a position yet where a computer is going to be able to you just, just sit back and get the computer to model it. No, no. You, you fire up the question, you've got the, you've got the question, you've got the model, you've got the tools there, then it's up to the to the teacher to give this expert modeling of, of how you actually solve that question. So basically it's, it's getting all the sections of the, of the site to kind of talk to each other, but ultimately it, it's the teacher that does the, the teaching. And so that's the big thing I'm kind of passionate about with my spot going forwards. Um, and I've, yeah, I'm, I'm I've done quite a lot in the last couple of weeks, and it's it's surprisingly uh, surprising how much you can get done when you actually give yourself a full day uh, to crack on with it. So it was it was a bit of a slog, but yeah, it started happening. So I've done it. So every question is linked with themes, cues and air, prime factor tiles, bar modeling, um, and algebra tiles. So those big five are all done. I haven't done place value counts yet. Well, that's going to be dead easy because I'm just going to look what I tick for Dean's blocks and it's going to be the same for place value counters. I'm pretty much pretty much sure of that. So once I've linked it to place value counters as well, then um, that'll be a quick one as well. And people will be hopefully pleased with that because that's one of the most used manipulatives on the site. It's just that I've left it to last just because of my own personal bias, I think. I think we'll also have to sit down, once you've done your mental methods, sitting down and looking at... Uh two color counters and multi-link cubes and that kind of thing oh yeah i've not so thought think, about it. yeah two color counters i've got to do as well yeah so all the anything to do with directed number as well to be fair anything directed number at the moment is linked to algebra tiles because two color counters are just a little a little subset of algebra tiles anyway all you need is the yellow and red tile so anything directed number fires up the algebra tile model for now but yeah yeah there is the two color counted resource and the directed counters as well there's there's yeah, I said I was doing all right. There's there's a lot to do. I mean, I was thinking about the, the uh, two color counters for things like the five frames that you've got and the ten frames. Well, actually, yeah. I think you can. Well, go yeah, quite... well, once, yeah, there isn't really things like yeah. There's not much on number bonds and stuff like that, and uh, super ties in as well. How, how, do you do randomly generated questions on that? How many dots are there? Maybe. Well, I mean, I I try to use your machine. But I always struggle to get the slider on the right amount of time. So I'm like two when I'm demonstrating to people, I'm like two point seven five seconds or whatever. And um, right. that's I mean, the sort like, of thing I, you should be telling me, Kieran, and then I can fix that because it's only like it's a ten minute job, Kieran, to fix that. Oh no! It, <laughs> <laughs> you said the, said the line. 
and um, you know <laughs> it's it's use your error it's my it's my her use of the mice I mean, i'll test it yeah but you, you say that though but like when you're a teacher in the thick of the moment you're like you don't want to have to worry about user error so these are the things that are actually important to me um, and, and and actual teachers using this in real life settings that's the most valuable feedback i can get really obviously um one of the reasons MassBot I think is quite good is because I do do use it Monday to Wednesday. And then I get all this lovely feedback from Twitter uh, and DMs and emails and all sorts from actual teachers using the resource. And you can't replicate that. Like if I just if I just say quit teaching completely now and just work through my to-do list on MassBot and, and finish that, yeah, that'd be decent. But like where are the new ideas going to come from? Where's the feedback? Where's where's the improvements going to come from? Like it, it needs to be used, and it's a it's an ever changing sort of beast that's always evolving. So please just hammer me with a request, or even if it's a little bug thing like that, just let me know because things like that are a quick fix. Yeah, I will do. Um, I mean that's the only thing I can think of, um, and, I, and I genuinely thought it was my fault, but I, I like that you've got the die and you've got the different representations on there. I mean, I often use the two color counters in the five frame because you can change that. You can swap up the colors different ways and stuff like that. There. And then, you know, so oh, I think really? there's loads of early maths on, on math spot that, uh, right mm. for, for teachers to engage with, you know, big time. No, that's another thing. Yeah. There is that primary section on, on math spot, which is literally just the randomly generated key stage one to key stage, sorry, uh, year one to year six sort of papers. Maybe should add into that section, like the, the primary, maybe more primary specific things like the supervising tool and the, and the number frames and stuff like that. Um, a bit more organization. There's nothing to stop it appearing in two sections if it's a manipulative and it's a primary specialist thing. I could chuck it in there. In the GCSE section, you might have the algebra tiles and GCSE questions. There's nothing to say a resource is sort of like stuck with 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 one heading only. Almost it can be be across headings so that's something to think about as well yeah i've basically i've spent 10 years making 188 things and only i know <laughs> only i know exactly what's there and how to get it uh, and i want the world to know like that there's all this stuff and this stuff's related to this stuff and like if you load up this resource it gives you the option to load up this resource like the question generators that i've mentioned you fire up this question then model it with these resources and maybe you know i like completion tables and i've only mentioned it once but you load up a ratio question on a generator you maybe model it with the bar modeling tool uh, you maybe do some practice questions and then you might say well why not try this completion table on ratio as well so so linking all the right because there's about 30 odd completion tables link those to a relevant generated question as well because the way these completion tables work for those people are thinking what on earth is the completion table is they generally encompass a whole topic uh, every single sort of like nook and cranny of a topic that you might get with one big table and depending what cells you reveal like on the ratio ones um, you hit different parts of that particular topic so all of the ratio questions assigned to the one ratio completion table and that's uh doesn't matter which one you're going through it's going to be relevant uh, relevant resource so that's another a job that needs doing, but I'm, I'm working through the manipulatives for now, linking those to the generators. Nice. I mean, yeah, it's going to, it's going to be awesome. I think, I mean, it already is awesome, but yeah, like you said, you know, I, I think I would consider myself engaged with the, with the site. And like I said, I said at the start, I mm -hmm. don't know how to get the most out of it, which is why I thought it'd be fantastic to sit down and talk to you about, uh, about yeah. what you thought the best way to get the most from it was, you know? Yeah, I'm I'm fully aware that there's loads on there, but it's really hard at the moment. It's getting easier, um, to to maybe find exactly what you want. So yeah, that's that's my um that's my aim for this almost like next year kind of things to stop making new stuff, improve the stuff that's already there, and make the stuff that's already there easier to find, and link it to relevant resources. So once you've clicked on a resource, what else? Where else can you go from this? So. Have that kind of journey, like you might start off with an example problem pair, then maybe do something under the visualizer, then jump to a model, then essentially go from the from the model to like a sheet of practice questions. Then after the practice questions, you might jump into your completion table, and then later down the line, jump to your test maker where you test all the stuff that you've done over several weeks. So you have that whole sort of 
learning cycle all the ingredients of a of a learning episode i like to talk about like all the way from start to finish like starting with your models and your metaphors and your representations all the way through your work examples your example problem pairs through to your practice and your tasks and then end up at your assessment and then start the cycle again with your next it'd be nice if mathbot did all that for you or at least nudge you towards the resources so that the teacher could then do that which feature do you think is utilized least that you wish teachers used more and why listen it's still the test maker i want everyone to know about it because i think it's great it's if you've not tried it just it's a game changer like I should, some of my some of my department hadn't seen it and they were like painstaking in making maybe these don't do knives from like typing out each question or maybe snipping from a website or something. So you do know you can just literally pick your topics, dink, 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 create test and, and it's there. And the URL's there for you with the difficulty level that you've selected. So tomorrow you just need to click on that link again, you get a new set of questions. And when you've taught under the topic, you just need to add one more checkbox and then it, it's done. So yeah, I'll stick with the... Uh, the test maker I'm trying to think if there's anything more original that i've not said the yeah something which i've not mentioned at all um are the structured variation grids uh, on math spot as well um it's it, the i do a, i do a session on what they are in fact i'm doing one in leeds in november actually but essentially it's like a two-dimensional grid and it exposes the structure of the maths being explored so like I wouldn't in, I wouldn't introduce say um, standard form any other way now than with a Gatenio structured variation grid so if you check out that on um, on MathSpot and have a play with it and essentially it's like it's your Gatenio's chart um, where you can reveal the cells individually but you can also scroll to the right scroll to the left scroll up and scroll down so it's infinite in each direction and above just the normal numerals well, that you'd expect on a Gatenio chart, the cells are split in two, so you can also show it what it looked like in standard form as well. So you can have maybe 7,000, then above it a little cell that says um, 7 times 10 to the third power. And um, the, all of the grids work in the same way. Uh, and they're just really fun to have a play around with, and it, they're really good for those what do you notice and what do you wonder. You just reveal a couple of cells and you say to the class, okay, what do you what do you think is going to be in the rest of this um, row? Or what do you think is going to be in the rest of this column? And can you tell me why you think that's true? And before you know it, they're making all these conjectures. And more often than not, they're, they're, they're describing exactly the math that you want them to, to discover. <coughs> so, yeah, I found them really powerful here. If you want to read up about them, it's um, John Mason and Anne Watson. There's loads of stuff on them. Just type in structured variation grids and uh, there's loads of nice stuff to read on them. Yeah, I think I think I've seen you speak about that a few times, Johnny, as part of some of you know you're here. Lots of things that I like to. Yeah, I've done two mass com sessions on them. I, I reused it. I don't often reuse my sessions, but um, I figured it was different ends of the country, so I'll use it twice. In fact, no, I think one was online and one was down in Gloucester. I think it was. So, yeah, I got a couple of uses out of that one, but it's yeah. due for a comeback, to be honest. So, yeah, it's been it's been a good two years since I did it. So, yeah, probably do it again. Yeah, I think it would have been Gloucester I saw you in, um, yeah. and also one of the, well, I don't know if it was a full mass conf or if it was a mass conf online. I definitely did online one, yeah. Yeah, mini one of mini ones probably, yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah, they're, they're fantastic. Like you say, once, you, once you've seen someone use them, and you're thinking, well, how can I use them in my class? How can I get the same yeah. principles and stuff? And the nice thing about those sessions as well, because you like you, you talk through what a structured variation grid is, and you, you show some of the really nice examples that you've used in the class. And then going back to that point that like the delegates or, are normally like the best resource, because then you say for the last 10 minutes or however long you've got, okay, can you think of, of how you might apply a structured variation grid to a topic of your choosing or a topic that you've got coming up? So then all the delegates are furiously thinking what topics they've got coming up. They come up with a structured variation grid, which they can take away and potentially use in the classroom. And then they'll share their idea with me as well. And then that just gives me more items for my never ending to do list. But um, but it, it's fun. It, it really is fun and it's and it's useful. So yeah, that's um that's a nice way of getting a few extra ideas just during a mass conversation. So you've you've mentioned your never ending to do list a few times. Mm -hmm. And obviously you've been making countless changes over the summer. 
how have you prioritized them? Has it been, I mean, it, it's pretty clear you've got a plan for how you see maths plot and it's almost, I don't know, ide ideal state. But obviously Patreon supporters can, mm -hmm. like Neil, yeah. um, can request changes if they want, can they? How have you wed those up? Because um, I know well, a lot of people do. So, well, essentially, I, I obviously need to earn some money. And Thursday and Friday, I'm not getting any income other than what um, I can get from patrons and, and the ads which are on mass part at the moment. So the plan is long term to try and get sponsors for each of the sections on mass part. So maybe the primary section uh, sponsored by someone, the um, the manipulative section uh, sponsored by some big manipulative provider and so on. We've already got the Hue cameras sponsoring the, the, the camera tool and the tools section of the site. And Julia Smith as well uh, is sponsoring a section of the GCSE site, the, the, the GCSE exam countdown with her five hours revision. So people, so there's a couple of people interested uh, so far. And, um, and basically I'm on the lookout for sponsors. So if you have a website and, and you want to sponsor a section of the site, get in touch and uh, we'll talk it through. And then what I do is I remove the Google ads from that page. Those annoying Google ads that pop up everywhere. They're annoying, but essentially I've got a server to pay for and I've got childcare <laughs> fee fees to pay for, which are not cheap. And I need to earn some money on the third and Friday. So that's how I do it. So the, it'd be lovely if I could get a little sponsor for each of the sections of the site, remove Google ads entirely. And then uh, patrons still get their little perks of uh, sort of like, you know, they can request me on their to-do list. They get their own little... Um, Google Forms to-do list and stuff like that. So hopefully it's still useful to be a patron as well. I've got some other ideas for patrons um, up my sleeve as well. Things like um, maybe some sort of like online CPD and stuff mm -hmm. like that um, of how to use the manipulatives, but maybe I offer that out free as well as well. I'm, I'm not sure, but the long-term plan is, yeah, uh, remove Google ads entirely and it supported entirely by sponsors for each section or, or patrons as well. That'd be lovely. Nice. I mean, Hugh cameras have been mentioned so many times, Johnny. I'm going to be expecting some of the commission you're going for that sponsorship. <laughs> they and don't forget Julia. Point. Don't forget Test Mass Julia as well with a five R. I need to mention her at least just as much as well. That's not fair. But otherwise, yeah. Uh, well, no, those are the first two. And to be fair, they kind of got in touch with me a little bit. And like, and obviously, I know them quite well. So, so, so we'll, we'll give it a trial run. And hopefully, other people will jump on the bandwagon and. Uh, yeah, get their site on. So uh, I don't know if Bruno ready and that lot's looking out now, and he wants his timetable Rexars on the on the primary on the primary section of the site. Then I'm all I'm all ears. Yeah, I mean they'd be daft not to. And yeah. I think yeah, I mean I don't maximize my Patreon account with you, and um, I, I I haven't sent you any emails with requests at like Sunday night at eleven o'clock. So um yeah, maybe in the future I'll have to <laughs> have to start sending my requests in. I think it's it's a really good way to support um you know creators artists that uh, that give a lot for and, and don't expect much in return you know because like you say you're you're not looking millions for this um what is a you know a site that's worth yeah. its weight in gold I think well the, I mean patrons do get the ad free version as well which I should probably mention so that does remove all the Google ads straight away which is which is handy so um. But yeah, um, essentially, I want it to be login free. So, yeah, you have to type in the uh, the current ad free code if you want to get rid of the Google ads. But essentially, the entire site is free to use to anyone that stumbles stumbles upon it because busy teachers don't have time necessarily to remember what the login is or forget password, reset it, and stuff like that. I just want it to be fire it up. There's my camera. There's my example problem pairs. There's my completion table or whatever, and crack on kind of thing. So that's the plan. Always login free is, is the plan. And I've said that for 10 years now, so I'm, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> this yeah. month's password is really easy to remember as well. It's a good one. Oh, yeah. I sent it out, didn't I, yesterday? So um, maybe we'll give the readers a free glimpse of it now. It's a bit early in the month. Sometimes at the end of the month, I'll say what the password is uh, just for the last five days or something so people can experience it. But once you go ad free, it's, it's like, oh, Sometimes when I forget to log on, it's like, what's all these adverts about? I put the code in, that's it. And just nice. sigh relief. Let's just do some quick maths. I think I've got an episode. This will be Saturday. Then we'll do, then I've got another two. So what about in the last episode of this season, Johnny? Will I tell people the password as, in, as part of my 
closing what? remarks or something or hide it yeah. somewhere in the episode? Until I change the passcode again, which will be sometime in November, I imagine. Now. What can we expect, maybe not necessarily from MathSpot, but from you over the rest of the academic year, Johnny? Any big plans for 23-24? Yes, there's, there's loads of gaps I want to plug in MathSpot in terms of the question generators. Um, because depending on what year group I teach um, and whatnot, sometimes I'll, I'll miss some of the higher topics. Now, I've not had a higher group for a few years, so I've got like a, a, a decent set of... Uh, sort of quite high attaining year 10 so I expect some some of the missing higher topics to appear this year but the overarching theme of this entire year will be getting MathSpot to work together as a as a complete package so you can just go in and you you know you're teaching something to do with fractions you start typing fractions in it'll be the fractions example problem pair it'll be the the cues and error rod modeling tool it'll be the the test maker with all the prerequisites to fractions and and things like that getting the whole site the user experience of the site um just as good as it can be so people it's almost like a, a default choice for for teachers to go to that's what i want i want as many teachers as possible using the site because it's really useful rather than like the maybe more specialist few. There's a few people, like a few really close friends now who like know everything about MathSpot, like, but like that's not the that's not the normal user. The normal user goes on the question generator, fires up 30 questions on fractions of amounts, and then maybe potentially moves on rather than all misses out on all the good stuff that MathSpot MathSpot can do. So yeah. Yeah, that's it. Not not make necessarily new stuff, but link all the stuff together. So exciting. I cannot wait to see this in, in full flow. Really brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And we test out with the boys at home. Oh, come on, boys. It's time to do your math spot. Oh, they'll, they'll certainly be more of a primary focus as well, because my, my little lad's just started year one as well. So whatever whatever maths he gets up to into year one, expect me to go through the years and add all the primary content. Backfill that as well. That's going to all get added. So, yeah. Maybe when he's doing A-levels um, in a few years down the line as well, I'll, I'll add some A-level content as well. There's one or two bits, but not much so far. Yeah, you, I mean, you've got about five or six years before he's ready for his A-levels. So, uh, yeah. you got, you got <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Always a pleasure, Johnny. All I have to do is say thank you for joining me. Well, thank you very much for having me, Kieran. And to everyone at home, until next time, thanks for listening.